Hey, Graceway, Pastor Tim here. So excited that you're joining us. So excited that we have the opportunity to celebrate and to honor the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I remember the first time that I watched Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. I was captivated. I was compelled. I believed. I wanted in. I wanted to be a part of it. And if I'm honest with you, I didn't exactly know how. I believed in the future, but I didn't know how to get there. And over time, God's provided me men and women from different backgrounds, different traditions, different places who, through relationship, have taught me, led me, invested in me. I gave them authority. I submitted to them. And, and God's used them in my life. And at the top of that list is, is Dr. Dwight Perry. He's my pastor. He's my friend. He's my mentor. He's my spiritual father. And I invited him here today to talk to us about the life of Dr. King. And more than that, talk to us about the gospel's ability and God's plan for us to gladly be one church. I'm excited to learn from him. I I know he's going to be a blessing to you. Would you join me in welcoming him to the Graceway stage, Dr. Dwight Perry? Well, good morning. Good morning, Graceway. I don't know about you all, but that worship team was hot this morning. Do y'all say hot down here in Kansas City? I, I don't know about you, but I, I said, why in the world do I even have to preach after that? We could just all listen to them, and that'll be the end of it. But good morning. It's so good to be here with you. I'm honored to be here. Uh, Pastor Tim, First Lady Ashley, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. And, uh, we in, thoroughly enjoyed our marriage conference yesterday. There were about 300 people here or so. And it was a wonderful, wonderful gathering. It, it, I, I just was overwhelmed, not only by the people who came, but also by the presenters and the panel that I was in. And for those of you who didn't come, I'm just going to pray that your marriage lasts another day, but that's a whole different issue. Uh, it, seriously, it was fabulous. And you should thank your church for putting on something like that. I'm going to be talking about a message this morning that, to be very honest with you, I normally would not be sharing, uh, especially in a, a mixed-race context. And the reason why, to be very honest with you, it's, it's not one of these feel-good messages. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, as Pastor Tim gave me the title for the message, oh, by the way, I normally don't allow people to give me titles for messages. But I submitted to Pastor Tim this time. But, you know, it was, it was something in my spirit said, you know, this is going to be a little tough one. But I'm willing to do this for two reasons. Number one, I love Grace Way Church. Amen? Can you all give the Lord a hand clap for your church? This is a wonderful church. And I love Pastor Tim and First Lady Ashley. I really do. I hope you all know how wonderful of a shepherd Pastor Tim is. I hope you all know how wonderful of a leader he is. And I hope you all pray for your first family because they are just gifts from God. And I'm so very grateful to be in their presence. In 1960, in an interview with Meet the Press, yeah, it's been around a long time, Dr. Martin Luther King in this interview would say these words. I think it is one of the tragedies of our nation, one of the shameful tragedies that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours, if not the most segregated hour in Christian America. You know, this interview took place almost 60 years ago. And it was tragic then, but to be very honest with you, it's even more tragic now. For even though there's been progress in terms of race relations, one cannot but help but look at Tremaine, Michael Brown, even Charlottesville, to say that we still have a long way to go. But you know what, brothers and sisters, I, I don't hate on folk who do not know Jesus who do things that are kind of crazy. As a matter of fact, I show compassion to them. My concern this morning and this message this morning is not going to be geared toward them. This is not a political message. My problem 
is not the reality that 60 years from that interview, the church today at 11 o'clock is still the most segregated hour, not because of our politics, not because of our society, but I believe the problem squares focus and fairly on the church of Jesus Christ and specifically the white evangelical church. The church that says it has truth, but yet has not lived out the reality that the gospel does make us one. And not just one superficially, but one in terms of our entire being with one another. I'll be honest with you, my friends. As someone who has served in the white evangelical church for over 40-something years, I have been hurt myself personally. So I had to really pray. I said, Dwight, don't preach this message out of hurt. Don't do that. That would be a disservice to God and a disservice to these people. But the reality is we need to be the people who hold ourselves accountable for what's happening in this nation, not our political leaders. If anything is going to take place to change this world, it's on us, y'all. Now, see, in my church, somebody would say, Pastor Perry, you preaching now. <laughs> oh, you did the best you could, praise the Lord. <laughs> so what I want to do this morning, I'm going to be talking a little bit different. I'm going to spend about 20 minutes in the passage that I've chosen that will lay a theological and biblical foundation for this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So if you have your Bible, turn to that with me, please. But then I'm going to take the last 10 minutes or so to really drive home 10 specific applications. And I've geared these applications not only around you as individuals, but also corporately you as a church. And I'm doing something a little different even in that, that I've allowed your pastor to, to put these applications on your website. I normally don't do that for a number of reasons. So when you see them, if you want further study and reflection, you can go and look at your website and download them, okay? Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much for your kindness. Pray now as we study your word, help us, Lord, to proclaim your word in the power of your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 says this, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have our access and one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. The apostle Paul was writing the, this particular letter to a group of churches in a town called Ephesus. It was in Asia Minor. And, and the majority of the people in this church were what we call Gentiles. In other words, they were not people from the Jewish tradition who had been raised with the Old Testament and raised with the Torah and raised from the law. They weren't church folk. They were some heathen folk like you and I. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, maybe just me then. Okay, whatever. They were far away from the truth of Scripture. 
And what Paul was trying to do in this letter in the book of Ephesians was trying to help them and trying to help you and I also today to understand that when you trust in the finished work of Christ, you are a different person. As a matter of fact, when you trust in the finished work of Christ, Christ indeed places you in position in relationship with him. In the first three chapters of the book, he explains all of the stuff that you and I have now as children of God, y'all. Yeah, I'm talking about Christmas, y'all. Woo! We have been redeemed with the blood of the Lamb. We have been foreordained to become one of his. We have indeed been sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's some good stuff, y'all. And then in chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, 9, he says, now that you know what you've been given in Christ, start living like it. Don't just know your theology. This is coming from an academic dean at a seminary. But live your theology. But understand that once you start living it out, there's going to be a devil. And he ain't got no little red suit on. Verse 6, 10 to the end, that's going to come against you. Therefore, you need to stand in who you are in Christ. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 11, verses 22 then, is, is trying to help these saints to understand this key truth. Not only should you revel in all that God has given you in Christ, you should live differently in relationship to other people. In other words, it's not acceptable to live like a heathen anymore with other people who are different than you just because they are different. Let me break it down a little clearer. It's not acceptable to hate on folk if they voted Democratic or voted Republican or whatever. It's not acceptable to hate on people if their skin is darker than your skin or if they sound like they come from y'all and we and whatever. <laughs> if they have trusted Jesus Christ, you are to live in relationship with them as a reflection of who you are in Christ. In other words, you are to live like Jesus with them. Now, see, in my church, somebody would say, Pastor Perry, you preaching today. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Let me give you three specific underlying principles based on this text that will help us to understand how, if we embrace this text, the gospel can make us one. With the first one being the fact that only Christ can break down the walls between us. Look at the text. Look at the text. It says this. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, whoo, I don't know about you all, but I'm going to shout on that one, y'all. Because I see myself in there. Now, Dwight, when you were in the hood in Woodlawn, didn't know nothing about Jesus. Now, Dwight, when you was out there doing all kind of craziness. Now, Dwight, when you was a fool beyond a fool. Now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the divine wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments contained in orange, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. Wow. You know, we needed two barriers broken down in our lives, whether we realize it or not. And this is what the cross has given us. That's what this text is teaching. Number one, 
The gospel has broken down the barrier between Jew and Gentile, not only Jew and Gentile, but between black and white, Hispanic, Native American. There should not be any barriers between people if you know Jesus. Stop looking sideways at that person that drives an F-150. If you're from the hood like me, are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> it got that rifle in the back. <laughs> if they love Jesus with that rifle in the back, you supposed to love them? <laughs> Cautiously, but love them. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a mess. <laughs> But he also broke down the barrier between us and God. There is nothing you could have done to appease the wrath of God. And that is why you needed a sacrifice for your sin. Only Christ can break down the dividing wall between us and others and between us and God. That word reconcile in verse 16 gives the image of someone who's been bought back out of the slave market of sin. You and I have been reconciled back to God. It's in the arrow's subjective tense in the Greek text. In other words, it literally means that when Christ did his work on the, Christ, on the cross, he did it once and for all, and it's done. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You don't have to get saved again. You don't have to do this again. When Jesus died for you, that was it, y'all. Now, I saw somebody would shout on that one. It is finished. It was done 2,000 years ago, and it still applies today if you put your trust in Jesus. First little principle that we see here in this text to help, that can help us understand how the gospel can make us one is that it's only through the gospel that those walls between us and God and walls between us and others can be broken down. Secondly, secondly, not only does the gospel break down the wall between us and God and one another, the gospel also gives us peace. And not just internal peace, but peace in our relationship. Look at the text. Look at the text. It says this, And he came and preached peace to you who were far away. Remember the context. These were Gentile folk. They were not Jewish folk. They didn't grow around the Old Testament. They didn't grow up with the religion. They didn't grow up as the people of God. They were some lost folk like you and I. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And the text is saying, He preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. What is this text saying? This text is saying quite simply this. It doesn't matter where you have come from. It only matters where you are going because of the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter if you were involved in drugs, if you were involved in prostitution, if you were involved in three or four marriages. It doesn't matter. When you trust the, the blood of Jesus, he's going to give you peace. It doesn't matter how twisted you are, as my grandson would say, he's 17, he's a Christian rapper, B buy his album. You can self-produce the deal, but I don't, you know, you know, <laughs> promoting him, his name is Ezra. Okay, okay. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter about any of that. No matter how whacked up and jacked up your background was, when Jesus died on the cross and when you put your trust in Jesus, Jesus says, I'm going to give you peace. The peace that he's talking about here is not only a conscious awareness that I'm in a right relationship with God, it is also referring to the fact that as a result of my relationship with God, I can be in a right relationship with one another. I don't know about you, but if you've been married for more than a minute, I've been married a long time, trust me. For most of you, your wives figured out the second day this wasn't going to work. My wife figured out the first day. Hear her story. She's got, my wife's a great preacher. She talks about how on the plane going down to the honeymoon, she said, why am I on the plane with this person? <laughs> but that's a whole different story. If you've been married for more than a minute, you know you need something supernatural to make it to the next minute. Amen? <laughs> no, I'm serious. You need something beyond yourself. To make it to the next minute, if you've been married for more than a minute, are you hearing what I'm saying? 
Only the gospel can help us to not look at people based on their skin color or their nationality or what country they're from. Some foolishness is going on right now. I'll say it. Some foolishness. Just foolishness to say something out. Foolishness. Foolishness. You all don't know, but one-fourth of all the Christians in the world are in Africa. In 19 out of the 20 largest Christian populations in terms of countries are in Africa and Asia. Foolishness. Foolishness. Second way the gospel bring, makes us one is by giving us peace. Not only peace with God, but peace with one another. But lastly, not only does the gospel give us, a, reconcile us back to God and one another, does the gospel give us peace to God and peace with one another. But the gospel, whether we understand it or not, the gospel has already made us one, whether we understand it as one body with one another. Look at the text. Look at the text. Says, I bring this part of this little message to a close. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. But you are fellow citizens with the same. Can you see, can you think how these Gentile believers were hearing these words? Who they had been called dogs by the Jewish people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This was a Paul was a radical revolutionary. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They were called, they would say, oh, we don't associate with Gentiles. Look, look, look through the mind of the text of how they were hearing this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. And you are God's household, apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you're being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. It grieves me that for whatever reason, not forever, I know it is a sin. Some of us who have maybe a Baptist background look down on folk who are from the Bible church background, or some of us who are, who are Reformed look down on folk who are dispensational, or some of us who are Protestant look down on Christians who are Catholic. Some, that is foolishness. Are you, all, are you hearing what I'm saying? If in that Lutheran church, that person loves Jesus, they're going to be with you forever whether you like it or not. Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> it's foolishness. We are the body of Christ. And I'm not just talking about if you're from Graceway in your particular tradition. It transcends our tradition. There's nothing wrong with having a particular tradition. I'm not putting that down, but it doesn't trump Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We get all bent out of shape about women in ministry and all these. That's just some foolishness. Amen. Foolishness. You can only preach from the King James Bible. Foolishness. That's some foolishness. See, I'm old. And I won't even remember what I said about this message five minutes afterwards. <laughs> so you'll come up to me and say, why did you say that? What, what did I say? I <laughs> Jesus would say it like this in John 17. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may be, may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I believe one of the reasons, especially in America, that the church is so stagnant is that the people who are in the world do not respect the Jesus that's supposedly in the church. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. That word believe is in the present tense in the Greek text. What does the present tense mean? It literally means that, that the world may continue to believe. It's something that continues on. That's the present tense. 
that your unbelieving neighbors will believe that Jesus is real, not because you put a track under their door. Put the tracks in the door. I'm not saying that. But if they see you act like a fool with other people, that's the Jesus they're going to know and recognize. I, I'm trying to break it down. I'm not that smart. Well, how can you as a church and how can we individually begin to see the gospel live out and make us one? Let me give you 10 practical applications, and then I'm going to sit down. Number one, once again, these are going to be on your website in a week or so, whenever it is. Believers need to become, that's you, believers, if you're a believer, believers need to become informed regarding the growing cultural diversity of society. It strikes me as significant, especially among quote-unquote evangelical Christians, how stupid and surprised we are that our country is becoming more diverse. As a matter of fact, real statistics, not fake news, Yeah, I said it. <laughs> it. says, in 2045, there will be more brown and black people of color in this country than white people. The implications of that statistic is far-ranging for the church. If the evangelical church still looks primarily white, are you hearing what I'm saying? Y'all ain't saying amen, so whatever. Okay. <laughs> If all the people you listen to, all, you know, these people on here, these people on here are primarily white, you're not reflecting. If this church does not reflect this community in all levels, including your staffing in all areas, that's an issue because you're not going to be able to reach in a contextual way the people that God has called you to reach. Number two, identify those areas in your own Christian tradition that have been affected by culture. Have you ever asked the question, why do most of the pictures we see of Jesus have a white guy with blue eyes and blonde hair, but he, he was born in the Middle East? The Middle East is still the Middle East, even though it was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> now, 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 maybe through some genetic whatever, you know, there are a few blonde hair, blue-eyed Middle Easterners. I just haven't met any of them, but, you know, I, you know. I, but why do we have so many things in our traditions that we think are biblical when it's just cultural? Identify and discourage organizational approaches that are ethnocentric in nature. Now, I know after this one, you all are never going to invite me back. So I'll just say it, and, and it's been good knowing you all. <laughs> Where in the Bible does it say that you have to have a 60-minute service? See, in my tradition, if the spirit hits around 59 minutes, <laughs> we keep going. <laughs> but. If I did that in this church, <laughs> I, they make sure you, they have a big clock up there. <laughs> y'all didn't know that, did y'all? Some of y'all. Seven minutes and 25 seconds left. Huh? <laughs> no, seven minutes and 17 seconds left. Initiate organizational strategies that promote reciprocal relationships with similar institutions of color. Let me, let me break this down for you. This is more as a church body. But the key word in this particular suggestion is reciprocal. Now, I know the white evangelical church has a lot of relationships with a lot of people all over the world, including this country, where they primarily, as the dominant partner, give money, give training, give this, give that, whatever. In other words, people of color have nothing to give back to you. That's hogwash. That's my Christian word for another word. That's hogwash. <laughs> See, I'm not going to remember it, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> One of the things that you have as a living example 
right here in this congregation is you have the lead pastor of this church who has submitted himself to an African-American pastor. And Pastor Tim is much smarter than I am. He really is, seriously. And he's much more well put together, and he's a great leader and all that. I just try to listen to him, try to keep him a little bit, you know, from going crazy on some parts of his theological reflections that I'm not going to mention right now. (laughs) We need to be learning from one another And if you have relationships here in Kansas City that are not reciprocal, they are paternalistic. And you're not helping the people of color to keep them in a place of subservient domination. Even though you might have good intention. Number five, model and encourage others to develop and maintain positive inter-ethnic relations. Let Let me break this down to you. If you haven't had a person who looks different than you over for dinner in the last three months, you're not doing this. Even if you're in a small group with a diverse or you're in a business that's diverse or, or even coming here to church that's diverse, if the brother or sister hadn't been to the crib, <laughs> that's the barrier. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm I'm speaking to the black folk here, too, also. That's the barrier. Develop cross-cultural skills of communication. I've got to say this. uh, Please forgive me. I'm asking forgiveness already. But when I hear make America great again, as an African-American who grew up in the 1950s and 60s, I hear make America white again. It breaks my heart. Because I know that my wife who grew up in the South had to walk on the other side of the street during that time when, when white people came by. I know my wife had to listen to people call her middle-aged father boy. I know I lived in the city of Chicago grew up in the inner city. I only saw one white person before seventh grade. And if I went to certain neighbors in Chicago, in the north, the enlightened north, I would not be coming back. We need to be careful with our words. Because words (laughs) communicate images. And if you're going to be a diverse community, you need to understand the implications of your words. Number seven, help people integrate their social ethnic culture within the majority culture. What does that mean? Music, dress, literature, all types of things can be different. They can reflect differences. It can be okay. You don't always have to have it so scripted. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It can kind of get out of control every once in a while. You can even have a preacher. That that was a mini holy dance just to kind of demonstrate. (laughs) It's okay, I'm still saved. (laughs) Empower people, members of minority groups. What does that mean? Now, this can apply to you individually, whether if you own a business or even if you don't, if you're a supervisor or in other settings where you have some level of, you know, are you, are you consciously looking? I had someone come up in the break after the first service and said, I'm in a company that has 300 or so salespeople, and none of them are people of color. So my question would be, what are you saying to the people at that company about that? You have a responsibility now. You have, you have been under the preached word if you're a believer. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't dichotomize the gospel. Church stuff over here, my real life over here. Teach and preach a Christian commitment to judgment. Now, this is not just for teachers and preachers like me. This is for you all. When you're at the water cooler and you hear that racial slur, speak up. 
When you hear them, when you're when you're at, at your job and you hear them doing something as it relates to even a young lady walking by, speak up. It's a shame that the Me Too movement is led by females. It should be led by men who are knocking those knuckleheads in the head. I said it. And I'll do it if they, I got two doors. If that ever happened to them, visit me in the jail. I have a jail ministry, because Dr. Perry going to jail. They do that to my two doors. Okay. I'm serious. You have a responsibility to, to teach and, and preach justice for all. <laughs> Lastly, integrate into the teaching of the local church, and not just on MLK Day. It's great you're doing it today. I'm not putting it down. Don't misunderstand. But throughout the life of the church, on a regular basis, a worldview that celebrates and reinforces the value of diversity. Let me read you one last passage. I'm going to stop. Why do I believe with all my heart that the gospel makes us one, and why do I believe we need to celebrate that? Quite simply, it's in Revelation chapter 7. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one can count from every nation and all tribes. Did you hear that? And all peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb and to the Lamb. Why do I believe that God, the gospel can make us one, and why am I committed to that? And why should you? Because the reality is, brothers and sisters, whether you understand it or not, whether you like it or not, we are going to all be in heaven together. Now, I want you to notice what the text said. The text did not say when we get to heaven, we're all going to be speaking English. No, I'm serious. We're all going to be white. I'm serious. I don't know what heaven's going to look like, but my understanding a little bit about it is we're going to be able to recognize one another, unfortunately, for my sake. <laughs> and there's going to be a celebration around the throne of the Lamb that all these different people are going to now spend eternity with their God. My question to you, Grace Way, is this. Why can't we start doing that today? God bless you all. I said to Dr. Perry, listen, you can hit any box you want to hit. You can say whatever you want to say. I just didn't know he's going to put them all in the same message. All right? Uh, no. And 6138, Doc. Uh, no. Listen to me. Um, this is an important day for us. I need you to understand that. There's a reason that I brought uh, Dr. Perry here to talk about those things. And, and I, I, want, I want to be a good pastor to you, and so I want to help you manage how you, how you may be feeling right now. Because here's what I know, that the enemy wants to say if you're feeling uncomfortable, it's because you just got indicted. Or if you just got challenged, you just got condemned. And, and that's not a biblical worldview on these issues. Whenever God says that the great command is to love the Lord God with all, all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor yourself, it means that I'm willing to look at you in my reaction. And I need you to understand that right now in this spiritual family, in this building, in this house, that there are brothers and sisters of ours who are struggling and hurting with what's happening in our world right now. And if you sit there and you say to yourself, well, he's, that's not me. I, how dare he call me that? I don't feel that way. Instead of looking at your brothers and sisters, instead of saying, help me understand, instead of being willing to listen, instead of being humble and being willing to learn, listen, you're not loving your neighbor well. And we're talking over one another right now. And we're, we're letting rhetoric that should not be in the church come into the church right now when I should be able to say, Dr. Perry, I don't understand that. Will you help me? we got to lean into this together. And so I, wanna, I want to tell you how important today is for our understanding of the gospel. And I wanted you to see me be under authority of an African-American man. It's important for you to understand. Until we share authority, we're not one. If only one people group has authority, we're not one. And so the reason that I asked him, yeah. 
I had somebody say to me, you know, you haven't been here long enough, don't feel, it's not that I don't, I don't feel like I can say it, okay? It's that I want you to hear him say it, and I want you to see me listen and submit and seek to do it. Shared authority is what's important. Shared honor is what's important. I love that man. And if you feel challenged today, praise the Lord, okay? If you feel uncomfortable today, praise the Lord, because, because he's right. We, don't look to Washington, y'all. The church, the church is the one who has been given the means necessary to look like this through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and we can do better, and we can grow, and we will, by God's grace. I, I'm so thankful for what Graceway is. I'm so thankful that when you walk around, we see all different types of people. But I need you to understand that privilege is stewardship. And we could go on and on with that, right? Privilege is stewardship. And God has given us the privilege of a diverse church, but, but that doesn't continue to happen if we don't gladly steward it. And so my, my challenge, my hope, my prayer, I'm, I'm passionate about this. And I know some of you, you're, you feel like, man, this is never going to get better, and you're losing hope, and you're, and you're, be hopeful, okay? Be hopeful. Believe in the gospel. Place your faith in the gospel. Lean into the uncomfortable. Lean into being challenged, and God will show up and be good and kind to us. He promised to do that. Amen? Okay. So I want to give you a couple things. We got growth track step two happening right after this at noon. Uh, growth track step two is around finding friends. And, and the wonderful thing about Graceway is if you find a friend in Graceway, he probably or she probably doesn't look like you. And so this is a chance for us to practice. And, uh, and we're starting small groups this week. I, I can't tell you how important it is for you to find friendship here at Graceway. I can't tell you how important it is for your relationship with God that you have people around you. And so I want you to get into a small group. Listen, I don't care what you gather around. I'm not talking about getting into an indefinite Bible study. I'm talking about a, a, a couple-month commitment uh, to meet on a weekly basis around something that you enjoy doing, okay? So preseason baseball or, or basket weaving or books or the Bible or coffee or food. I don't care. I just don't want you to come to church, this building, and call it church. I want us to practice this throughout the week, okay? So please go to the website, sign up, visit graceway.com org backslash groups, get connected to a group, uh, continue to think about these things. I promise you, I promise you that God will show grace to a church that is pursuing these things. Amen? Okay, stand up and let me pray for us. Dr. Perry and I, Dr. Cynthia will be in Guest Central. Love to have you stop by and say hello to him, but uh, let's pray. God, I, I come to you today and I'm I'm great. I'm challenged right now. I'm, I'm grateful to have been reminded. I'm grateful to have my thinking pushed on these things. It's good. I'm thankful that you're a God who's kind to us. I'm thankful that you're a God who has committed to build his church. And I'm thankful that your church doesn't look like one group of people. God, we come to you today and, and maybe we're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe we're feeling backed into a corner. What, whatever we're feeling, would you, would you push us on by your spirit into redemption and restoration? Would you push us on into oneness? Would you push us on into conversations where we listen and we learn together? Would you push us on to that church that is truly a city on a hill? God, as our city, as our world gets more separated, the church should be strengthened in its diversity. And so I pray on this day that we celebrate the life of Martin Luther King, this good word from your book that we heard today, that your spirit would do what only you can do. Unite us under the blood of Jesus Christ to magnify him, to make much of him, to give him glory for for your praise and for our joy. Strengthen us today, God. We love you. We thank you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you. Have a great day.